Hello and welcome to Always Take Notes. In this episode, Cassia and I spoke to Patrick Walsh, who is a literary agent at PEW, or rather is PEW, it's his own operation. And uh, in full disclosure, Patrick is also my literary agent. Yeah, we had a really um, interesting chat uh, with him uh, in his really wonderful little office up some stairs in a, in a Soho back street. With a dog? With a dog that was scrabbling around. I've actually t- took a photo of the dog. Uh, it's on my Instagram feed if anyone's interested. It's very, very sweet. It was in a little wine crate. I took a less good photo of the dog. It was terrible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, apart from the dog, we chatted about changes in the publishing industry, what he actually spends his day doing, what his job looks like, and also asked about his advice for aspirant writers and agents. So Patrick's a very charming man, also a um, well-established literary agent and has been a tremendous champion of my own work, um, for which I'm really grateful. Uh, we really hope you enjoy this episode and find it informative. Patrick, can you tell us a little bit about your um, your career as an agent and how you got into it? Sure. The route to yeah. where you are now. Well, so I studied law. And then, um, at the last moment, swerved out of a law firm into publishing. And I worked for a wonderful woman in um, Charing Cross Road for two or three years. And then um, I worked for, and with actually, later years, someone called Christopher Little. We went through the whole um, explosion of Harry Potter with him, which was amazing. And Could you tell us a bit about that? Well, I, I think he'd have to tell you. you know, <laughs> people are very close-lipped about that whole story. But it was wonderful. I mean, it was a, you know, it was a small agency that we were building. Um, and in that period, um, you know, the Harry Potter manuscript came in, it sold for a small amount of money, and then book two or three, I can't quite remember, just exploded. And the agency had to grow extremely fast as a result of that. And I was there probably about eight years. And... Um, and went into partnership with Chris, which was great. And then I left and I set up um, really from my apartment and um, my partner's um, apartment, Claire Conville, we just started sort of, almost sort of out of willpower, a new agency. And we built that over 16 years and that went very well. And that was called Conville Walsh and it was great fun. And then um, we sold that agency to Curtis Brown over about sort of two year period. Um, and then last summer, I decided to leave and start again, so. Is it um, quite normal to have this sort of very entrepreneurial thing of setting up new agencies? And... Um, I think agencies are like amoeba, you know, they're, they, they're very, you know, they, agencies start really by people splitting off from other agencies and that's very much a common pattern and driven by sort of the individuals sort of concerned. Um, the selling of agencies isn't that common. Um, but it's, it's always a hope, I suppose. And what is it that you wanted to achieve with your kind of with 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 Pew? What is it you wanted to do differently, or what was your vision for it when you left and, and, and started it afresh? Um, well, so it's interesting. It, it was more a move towards something rather than it, than a move against, if that makes sense. Um, you know, the last sort of couple of years, I'd end up working in a huge corporate environment, which I very much enjoyed. But what I love doing is sort of working on actual books. Um, working on the text and shaping proposals and so on. And so I decided to sort of make the move in order to do much more sort of editorial with my authors, much more sort of creating of books with them. You know, I'm never going to be an author, but um, there is a vicarious thrill to sort of helping someone do their own thing. And, um, and also reconnecting a lot with a lot of the European publishers that I'd become increasingly mm. distant from who really the whole of my career I've worked as much with European publishers as I have with the British ones and I wanted to sort of recreate those links. And you, you took a lot of your authors with you, yeah. um, was your you know, was your intention to have um, sort of strengthen those ties or to create new ones with, with new authors and how does the relationship, um, the ongoing relationship um, with Paul and Walsh um, work as, a, as opposed to you know, with regards to um, foreign rights and TV sure. rights and, and those kinds of things. Well, so, I mean, the good thing about my leaving, um, uh, leaving myself, in a sense, and Curtis Brown, was um, that all the people that I worked with were very old friends, and after an initial sort of period of discussion about it, we just sorted out a deal where I could leave. I wasn't prevented from working because I had restrictive covenants and things in my contracts. And, um, and I could carry on working with the team of foreign rights um, 
people that I'd worked with for 10 years or something, um, which is a very good symbiotic relationship. And we struck a deal that, that that would carry on for probably at least two years, and then we'd revisit it. And the same things happened with the, the film people that I work with at Curtis Brown. Um, and it's worked extremely well. You know, they're doing deals for us all the time. So. And could you tell us a bit about what your work involves on a day-to-day basis? This is something we're always fascinated to find from people in different bits of publishing. Yes, I mean, it, 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 weirdly, that's a question I've been asking myself. Um, so <laughs> so about, about, about sort of three weeks ago, I sort of did that thing that you do, a work equivalent almost of a sort of food diary. And um, basically, my normal sort of working pattern is um, I wake up quite early, so I'm normally up at about 5.30 or 6.00. And from about, I would say, 6.30 to about 8, 8.30, I'll work on a manuscript in the mornings. Then I'll come here, normally here, about 9.30 or 10. Um, what a lot of authors don't realise is that you just can't edit or read. Most people can't edit or read during the daytime, during a normal working day. Um, so very often you get the plaintiff for, you know, phone call from an unsolicited um, author saying, you know, what do you think? And you sort of go, well, you know, I've had to go out to dinner or I've had to see my family or stuff. Um, so, so that's the difficult part of the balance. But during the daytime, to answer your question, really, you're phoning publishers, either hassling them about existing um, projects that you're working on, on publicity or marketing or editorial, or you're talking to them about new books. Um, almost every other day, you're out for a sort of lunch or dinner with um, an editor or an author. So it's one of those sort of jobs where work very much bleeds into your sort of personal life. There are less divisions. And then very often in evenings or weekends, you're trying to make the time to read. Um, that's the constant battle, is sort of when do you read and edit. And how many irons in the fire do you have at any one time, both in terms of particular projects you're taking to publishers and your roster of clients? It's, um, I, again, it's a hard question to answer. I mean, I probably have about 50 active clients at the moment. But as you both know as authors, you know, it could take a year or two years for someone to write a book. And amongst, most of those people are, are under contract in one form or another. Some of them, uh, the, the exception, some of them I speak to almost every day. Um, other people I don't hear from for months at a time. They're perfectly self-contained. Um, and, uh, but one thing I have been doing in the last year is a lot of work in terms of finding new authors and new projects. And that has taken a lot of time. So you're always sort of, in your mind, you're always working sort of, I mean, I find as an agent, I'm always working two or three months before I submit something. Um, so for the last month and a half, I've been talking a lot to authors about projects will get out probably in September, October. I, I just want to commend both your heroic seriousness as, <laughs> as, as your very sweet puppy just sort of leapt for a while. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> sorry. No, I was, I was very impressed that no one just wanted to giggle. Um, I, was trying so not well to to I was trying not to look. <laughs> I just wanted to ask, we were um, speaking a little while ago um, to the to Nicola Solomon, the chief executive mm-hmm. of the Society of Authors, and she told us that uh, there has been a sort of downward trend um, amongst uh, authors, uh, uh, their revenues essentially from oh. from their work, and uh, we wondered if this is something that is reflected in your work and, and whether you've um, seen this with, with your own clients, both the more established ones and the newer ones, and if there's something that you do to to work around it or to advise them. It's, it's, it's a really good point. I mean, I think, um, I think it, it's not a new thing, whatever Nicola Solomon may say. Um, there have always been authors who are sort of two, on book two, three, four or five in a career who suddenly find their earnings dipping, whether because people stop buying their books as much or because their publishers haven't published them as well. And... Um, so, I, I mean, I'd slightly take, uh, not, not take exception, I'd slightly argue with Nicola about that. But, um, but you know, there's no question that um, authors do encounter that moment where their sales go down. And it's an extremely hard thing to reverse because the bookshop key account managers, i.e. the buyers for the, the, on a national level for Waterstones or whoever, very often order a book based on what they sold on the previous book. And so you get into a pattern of declining orders, mm. and it's extremely hard to reverse that. And really the only way you can do it is um, publishers and everyone involved with the book going out and, and making an absolute noise and sort of um, sense of excitement about a new book. But the book has to be able to live up to that, you know. Um, publishers and everyone can do all the groundwork, and they can get it absolutely right, but word of mouth won't ignite, and that's when it goes wrong. You know, people recommending it to each other. So the book has to be brilliant. 
And in your experience, have um, advances held steady for, for authors, or are there sort of um, larger trends within kind of advances and the way um, deals are, are struck? I think, I, think, um, I think certain areas, I and mean, again, the area we were just talking about, people with, with declining sales patterns are having real problems, but um, I think, you know, again, it's always been the case, but I think one thing that is being absolutely accentuated is the size of big deals are just getting bigger. Mm. Um, and that's partly because if you look at um, the earnings, particularly, say, commercial fiction writers, um, that pattern of people will buy the print version of a book, but they'll also buy the e version mm. of a book. That's increased the earnings of the sales of these, you know, the really big brand authors like Stephen King or Barbara Taylor Bradford or all the old juggernauts. Their earnings have gone up exponentially. I'd be fascinated to look at their sort of royalty mm. statements because of this they're almost adding a third to their earnings per book. And the advances um, when publishers are trying to find people to replace them as, are following that trend, you know. So you see e-books as, as adding rather than cannibalising print book sales? They certainly, I mean, not, not exclusively, but they have, yeah. Can we talk a bit about the, the mechanics of selling books? Again, what we, what we try and do with this is, is provide for people who maybe don't know anything about it, just to show sure. about how it all works. So could you explain a bit about the, the different ways that fiction and non-fiction are sold and then what goes into that process with non-fiction of, of crafting a proposal? Sure. I mean, with fiction, the, you know, there's, there's very little sort of other way to... Do, oh, it's very unlikely to be able to sell a, a, a novel on a proposal or chapters. It happens, but it's very, very rare. And it happens particularly for more established authors who you know, can be trusted to deliver something for a given market. Um, with non-fiction, it's very common to sell a book on commission. And the key thing there is you're trying to... Um, but the way to sell a book on commission is generally for the author to write some sort of proposal which um, functions to some degree as a mini-book. Um, so it will um, have a chapter breakdown, perhaps with a page or two for each chapter of the book. Um, it will have a sort of concept statement, what, what the book is about. It will think about the market. It will think about how this author is perfect for this particular subject, what their expertise is. Um, so really, you're trying to create a proposal that when it lands on an editor's desk, excites her or him. Um, but then beyond that, when it's circulated within increasingly corporate culture of the publishing world, it preempts every possible question that other departments can have, from marketing to sales to publicity. And then everyone gets together at an editorial meeting and goes, right, we're going to go for this. So, and th there's no one uh, shape to a proposal, but you can very easily break down the constituents to it. So. Well, this is what I found fascinating when we were working on my book. It seemed that there really is this, this huge art to doing a successful proposal. Yeah. So you're very adroit at. How do you kind of feel what's going to be the right way to skin that cat? You know, whether it's chapters and synopsis or, or breakdown. I think honestly, it depends on on the actual book. But I, I, you know, there are certain just really key elements. You know, one can you know often um, we're approached by people who are journalists who want to write a non-fiction book, and understandably both publishers and agents can be a little bit worried um, about journalists writing books you know they're writers so they should be able to write books but um, you know they may be used to being sort of copy edited at, at, in every single moment that they file something and they may also suffer from a syndrome which you see in some journalists um, there was the dog jumping on a chair <laughs> sorry everyone <laughs> sorry that's sorry that's next time we'll, we'll do this on video dog. but um, <laughs> but uh, you know, some journalists can't actually hold eighty to a hundred thousand words of text in their minds. You know, they they are, they train themselves to think in two thousand word chunks, and and the key thing with a non fiction book, I think, is um, you have to think of it as a relay race. You know, each chapter is handing forward a baton, and and, and that baton is a thematic baton around which the whole rest of the book is woven. So you could diverge from it as far as you want as a writer, but you have to have that backbone, and. Um, and that's the thing that some journalists can't do. And, and it's not just journalists. Yeah. And that, that length of proposal, I mean, is that... They, is again, that I mean, there? you know, you could sell with, with, with the world expert on whatever it may be, you know, the world expert on bats, if he or she can write, you can sell that book on sort of you know, 10, 15 pages. Um, generally, these days, there's been a sort of a competition amongst authors where people are writing longer and longer and longer proposals. 
um, which drives some people mad because they could spend six to nine months working on a proposal, but other people love it. You know, and I have a couple of authors. Um, one of them has just delivered a proposal that's 184 pages um, last week. And she's done that because she spent a year working out her ideas for the book. So it's been benefiting her as much as the idea of selling it. And another one um, has done exactly the same thing, but has put a lot of original research that she's done into the proposal. Um, but generally, I would say, I mean, 40, 50 pages, you know, well written. And you were mentioning getting back into the European market. Yeah. How do you see the European versus the US, and then I suppose, sorry, the UK and then the US is another area. How are they different literary marketplaces? Well, America's, America's a huge market. And it, it's, it's the most important of the non-fiction markets. You know, if you have a book that might, be, might strike a British publisher as relatively obscure, but very well written. It might be turned down by British publishers, but you know, if it's well written, you'll probably find an American publisher for it. And it's a, it's a dynamic market. It's a really dynamic market. Um, but it's, it's dominated by corporate publishers who are very hard-headed about what they take on. But there's a, there's a sort of group of what I call the sort of Brahmin New York publishers who just love ideas. They love good writing. They'll follow sort of the author and back them to, to, to a degree that you don't really find in Britain anymore. Europeans, um, you know, if we sell an intelligent book with a completely translatable international subject, you should be able to sell it in sort of 10 or 12 languages, um, depending on the subject. So, and the main markets are America, Germany, Japan, Italy, Holland, you know, I mean, they all vary, but most of the European markets um, are really quite strong. And then in Asia particularly, you get the um, Taiwanese, Korean, Chinese markets and Japanese markets, which have just grown and grown and grown in the last few years, China particularly. And how does the, the kind of film TV piece fit in, particularly with this, this boom for long-form TV drama and yeah. the sucking up material? How, is that affecting the world that you're operating on? Definitely. I mean, the last year, the amount of sort of film options and deals we've done has, has just rocketed. Um, and I think everyone is finding that at the moment. You know, you've got Hulu, Netflix, Amazon, all piling into the market and buying um, options. And, um, and it's really affected non-fiction publishing um, you know, from long form journalism through to uh, narrative non-fiction um, and you know, some very sizable deals being done at the moment. You've talked about sort of two changes, um, both sort of, um, growth areas in Asia and also the effect of TV rights on, yeah. on um, the publishing industry. Are there any other broad changes that you've seen over the past five years? I think um, just going back to the non-fiction side of things. I think American and British publishers slightly lost confidence in intelligent non-fiction publishing about five years ago, probably. And that's just roared back in the last two years. You know, they're all buying great sort of intelligent non-fiction again. But there was a period that, you know, they were just very, very, they lacked confidence in their own ability to sell these books. And I think that was partly because there was a sort of disconnect between buyers, bookshops and publishers. Um, which seems to have been sorted um, to a large degree now. Um, and I, I think um, the area where, where there's a bit of a... You talk to editors where they're lacking confidence, it's actually literary fiction, which they're finding increasingly hard to sell. You know, getting wonderful reviews. They're great writers being published, but um, book editors complain that, A, they're not being submitted really good literary fiction, that maybe there's just less of it around mm. and being written, and, B, that it's harder to sell at the moment. But the Chinese thing, just going back to that, I mean, that is a massive change. You know, five, I don't know, five, eight years ago, we were doing deals there for $1,000, $2,000. And I, I have an author who's made f over $400,000 mm. two years running now from one book in royalties from China. Um, and that's extraordinary. <laughs> I mean, really extraordinary. So what is it, do you think, that's, that's changed there? What is this? Is it a particular appetite for... Um, a different kind of, of, of storytelling in, in Asia, or is there other I think, other I think, I think, it, I think it's still evolving. Um, it, it's still driven to a large degree by self-improvement, you know, mm. whether tacit self-help or, you know, um, deliberate self-help. But, you know, th th this, this is a consumer base that has become so sophisticated so fast, mm. and so, it's so big, um, that they're buying sort of everything that tells them about the world. Mm. And literary fiction is beginning to sort of follow through, um, but you know, it's slow. 
And do you see those shifts continuing or are you beginning to see sort of other trends um, coming through that will affect you know, the industry going forward? Um, I mean, so, so I'm fascinated by the downturn in ebook sales. Mm. You know, seventeen percent drop. I think I think was the, the latest research. Um, uh, may just be a temporary pause. You know, it may sort of roar back. But I'm I'm really interested in that, and and we'll see whether that continues. And there was research um, uh, conducted by one of the the huge um, uh, sort of market research companies that concentrates on um, the publishing and music worlds. And they found that one of the big changes is children turning against ebooks and teenagers. The market everyone assumed would be the most sort of fascinated that they're turning against it because they're beginning to associate ebook readers with school mm. and they don't want the same devices at home. Um, so they want to read print. It also seems that um, because of, of or, I mean, maybe this is, just, this is just my theory and you'll disagree, but it seemed to me in the past few years that because of um, ebook readers, there's been more concentration on books as objects. Yeah, I agree with that. And um, that has led to, you know, greater efforts in, mm. in making them beautiful objects that, you know, deserve their space yeah. um, in, the, in the physical world, which is, is lovely to see. But do you think that's uh, sustainable to that carry on or do you think we'll see yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I suspect, help? I mean, I think... If you think about it, you know, a lot of English paperbacks, you know, you, two, three years after you'd bought them, you know, they would go yellow and you'd throw them away. You know, they were becoming utterly disposable objects. Uh, I'm not sure that's changed hugely, but, um, yeah, if you went to meetings with American publishers a few years ago, they would talk about how they were sort of trying desperately to revitalise their design departments. So Americans are great at design, generally. Um, and then here, the same thing started happening. Um, and again, you've always had publishers who are brilliant at it, but there was more sense that the, 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 the whole package over and above the words had to be, become an object that people wanted to keep. Mm. Um, and, and I'm sure that's going to continue. I mean, you see you know, divisions like the Penguin Press division of um, Penguin Random House make huge efforts mm. in that regard, or Knopf in America, yeah. similarly. Um, some really brilliant designers. Um, over the, the sort of well, it's been happening for a long time now, but it seems that publishers have consolidated, yeah. um, and you get these sort of much bigger um, collections of imprints. Mm -hmm. How has that altered the market, and does that have ramifications that are ongoing that we still haven't that haven't yet fully developed? Um, so again, it always used to be the case that in in the more conglomerate group, you know, sort of whenever it was 20, 25 years ago. American publishers became terrified of being excluded from the English language British Commonwealth market because of the EC. And they started buying all the independent um, uh, British companies that they could. And similarly, British entrepreneurs started doing that. And you ended up in a situation where largely foreign owned companies owned the majority of sort of British publishing. You know, Hachette, who are French, you know, Holtzbrink, who are German, Bertelsmann, you know, who are German. And Simon Schuster, you know, Viacom in America, and even in those early days, it became already a rule that if you were submitting an agent um, a proposal or a novel to different constituent parts of the same company, which would often have three or four different companies working independently but under the same umbrella, um, if they start, if different parts of the same company started competing for the same project, you had to tell them so that they weren't bidding against themselves. And that rule has extended. So Hachette, for instance, you know, um, of, with whom you're published, you know, must have at least 12 or maybe more um, different imprints who can actually bid against each other. Um, but it, it'd be madness for them to you know, bid only against each other. So the rule is, as with Penguin Random House and other companies, that if they start bidding against each other, you have to tell them to stop unless there is an external party bidding. Um, but you know, as the groups get increasingly conglomerate, you know, really it's Hachette, you know, or Penguin Random House, or HarperCollins. Um, so we're beginning to run out of sort of places to sell a book um, on an open market, you know, in terms of the conglomerates. Um, but what's really interesting is the dynamism this has brought to the independent publishers who are just really kicking ass at the moment. They're very good. You know, Granter and One World and people like that, and and they are finding sort of overlooked books all the time. 
Just thinking on, on what you said there, um, does the, the imprint then have a future if it's becoming, as you say, like a, a silo of a decreasing number of conglomerates? Will it? I, I can't see the conglomerates having futures without imprints. To sort of reverse your question, um, I think I think to have if you imagined a company with sort of two hundred editors all working one giant open plan office, all doing sort of different parts of the same thing. It's not going to work as well as having teams of people who are really excited about publishing books on colour or publishing books on Britain or whatever it may be, you know, who become experts in that field or, or who, are, who are omnivorously expert in one area of, of fiction or, or non-fiction, whatever it may be. Um, and, and you see it time and time and time again that the best model for publishing is the independent publisher model. But if it's going to have, to, if if you're going to have it in a conglomerate, it has to be replicated in that form in a, in a conglomerate. And the conglomerates have been really clever at preserving that, and and it's in their interest to do so. And a question again about well, this is about relationships, really, because it seems that so much of your job is is about relationships with authors, with with publishers. Yeah. How do you go about maintaining those relationships, particularly when you're you know, it's in your author's interest to get the best deals for them, but you're a repeat customer in the marketplace with editors. You mean maintaining those relationships with editors? Well, on both, yeah, with everyone. Well, I think the, I think the editor, I mean, people always expect it to be more complicated than it is. It isn't that complicated. Really, sort of when you're going around seeing editors, initially it's a work thing, you know, because you deal with these people so much and so regularly, you sort of become friends, you know, sort of, you know, work friendships develop. Um, it's a small world. You know, you do tend to get to know the editors sort of quite well, or the ones who you share similar tastes with. And um, but you know, it, it's it's an author-facing business. You know, your relationship is with the author. Your job is to get them the best deal. Um, and it, it can be difficult. You know, the, the friendship with the editor can be difficult because sometimes you just have to you know favour the author over that friendship. But that's what you're being paid to do. How big is the pool of editors that you're dealing with? It's in, again, I mean, it, it, normally if, if I'm sending out, say, a, I don't know, an intelligent popular history or a science book or a memoir, in Britain, generally it's about 15 editors, people um, rather than firms, that will be the sort of the, the pool of people to whom to submit. In America, it can be 30. And do they tend to respond in the way you think, or do they? Could you feel you have? They really never really... respond in the way that you think. I mean, no, no. I mean, no. You're always being let down. You know, it, it, it's that moment where you get wildly excited about a brilliant book. Um, you ring editors up, you send it out, and then someone who you're convinced is going to buy it turns it down. And there's that moment that sort of jolts your confidence. Uh, but most of the time, it'll sell. You know. One thing that was said to me actually with regard to. Magazine writing, not mm. books, but that you you know you think you're selling it to the editor, but the editor has to sell it again internally. Mm. Do yeah, you, is that does that apply? In, it's absolutely it? true, particularly in the conglomerates. You know that um, you know you might have an editor working in a in a in a boutique imprint section of a big company, but once they get once you get behind, you know, the Wizard of Oz moment is when the editor then has to engage with a giant machine, which is the sales, distribution, wholesaling side of a company. And very often that's much more sort of diffuse and works across the whole sort of conglomerate. And you do need a sort of internal advocate who will sort of work the system to your advantage as the author and, and to their advantage as the editor. And um, it, 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 that's the bit that very often authors don't quite realise is that there's a whole chain of stuff that, that goes down the system. When, and again, it's a relay race. It's sort of people passing your book down the whole way to the printer and the wholesaler and the bookshop. And the person driving it is the editor. Um, and do you still find doing deals exciting? I, mean, you, you I love it, yes. I mean, we just did an auction last week where, you know, it's the middle of summer, you know, I thought, okay, I'm not going to try and sell this in the summer. And then I phoned all the editors. They were all here. You suddenly realise that the English editors don't go away for two months, you know, like the French. They're here and they want to do something. So we sent out this proposal and we had an auction. It was absolutely wonderful. And that thrill never goes away, you know. And in terms of the guiding author through that, I mean, I remember when mm. we were selling my book, you were fantastic at this, but I didn't really have any idea what was going on. <laughs> I have not really that. been through the process before. Yeah. And I remember, you know, when there's a preempt that comes in and, and all yeah. that sort of thing. And, and, you know, it's a, I think I, we talk, Kazia and I, but also with our writer friends, you know, people have 
you spent a long time trying to do this and it's a hugely yeah. emotionally significant thing when it works out and stuff like that. How Absolutely. Do you, how do you go about kind of holding, holding your author's hand through that? I think, I think there's, there's, there's a certain amount of sort of author management that it has taken me years to realise the point that you made, which is that, um, you know, like any small world, you know, whether it's, I don't know, some hobby or a business or whatever, there are these weird phrases and languages. It's almost like Scientology. You know, what on earth is a preempt to someone who's not in... Can you explain to what a preempt is? Well, so a preempt is you're trying to, trying to imagine a sale room. You know, someone puts a vase up on the... On the on you know up for bids an auctioneer takes bids your book is the vase in a preempt as if someone runs into the room before anyone's had a chance to bid and says okay i'll give you you know a hundred thousand pounds for that vase now don't put it on the block in the sales room so what they're trying to do is buy it um before anyone else has a chance to do so and what that means is that the only way that's going to work is if they offer their highest possible amount at that moment rather than wait for an auction to go through rounds and rounds and rounds. It's almost like a single person version of a Dutch auction. And then the author has to decide, um, do you or do you not accept that preempt? Um, and, and, you know, most of the time we don't accept a preempt. You know, you, you, what you do is you... If you're lucky enough to be in a situation where there's an auction, um, you go in rounds. You know, you ask everyone to bid, see who keeps going up, and at a certain point, the author rever- reserves the right to make a decision, not just based on money, but on all the other bits of the the deal as well. Obviously, as you've just said, these these deals can be quite um, complex. You've got to take a lot of things yep. into account, and you've talked earlier about. Um, you know, the problem of declining sales over the sort of second yeah. and third books. Could you talk a little bit um, about the strategy of um, advances? Because if an author is getting a whopping great advance for their first book, mm. that presumably has consequences yeah. um, in terms of their second and third books if, if you know, they don't manage to, to earn that out. Can you talk a little bit about, about that and, and what that means for, for authors? It, it's, it, I mean, that's, that's the sort of the issue that people wrestle with all the time. Um, it, it, one of the curious things about the last sort of 20 years in publishing is that if you're a talented writer and you can write well, the best thing you can also be as a first book author, um, in some regards, not always, but um, in the sense that you've got no sales record, everyone can sort of pin their hopes on you and imagine you're going to be a huge bestseller. And, and that clean slate is, is incredibly valuable. You know, that's why first books go for so much money sometimes these days. And um, the problem is, you know, imagine a situation where someone gets a, a really big advance, say, I don't know, a quarter million pounds or something. Um, their book sells, whatever, you know, 150,000 copies, but it makes nowhere near that money back. You know, 150,000 copies is a really good sale. Mm. But the moment he or she sort of decides to or has a new book ready to be bought um, the first thing the publisher's accounts team do is look at the earnings um, and very quickly very quickly you're in a sort of interesting situation which is at what point is the best moment to do a deal and it's an inexact science you know the best possible moment to do a strong new deal is after you've earned a lot of money for the publisher and yourself um, but where you are in that sort of curve is always a, a difficult um, moment. And most authors generally want to do a deal before they've earned enough money to justify you know, the advances that they want. So again, you're trying to sort of calibrate you know, hope and expectation and sort of long-term earning potential. Um, it, it, it's, it, uh, the only way I can express it is an inexact science. It has so many factors. How keen is the editor? How, you know, how, how is the author's sort of writing ability and sort of commercial now sort of growing? Um, and you're trying to find that moment on all these parallel lines sort of running across a sort of grid of sort of finance. You're trying to find that moment where you go, okay, this is the moment to strike the deal. Um, uh, but also you want to strike a deal that leaves the publisher happy. So. And the author. Yeah. Um, and with sort of good future prospects. Yeah. Bearing all that in mind, what would your advice be for aspirant writers? I think, I think it always comes back to the book, you know, and um, it, it sounds a very trite thing to say, but it really isn't. 
you know, the better the book. You know, publishing is full of people who are there because they love good writing. You know, that's why they're not bankers. That's why they're not engineers. You know, they've made a conscious decision to work in the publishing world. And, um, and in, in a non-pejorative way, they've sublimated their lives, you know, their working lives to other people's talents. So someone with, with real talent um, produces a great book, you know, nothing makes them happier. And they want nothing more than to, you know, sell that book and get the word out there and, and, and get people talking about it. And that comes back to the book. You know, if you, if you can um, spend your t- as much time as you can, you know, sit on your hands as much as possible, uh, and you're impatient, just get the book absolutely right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and if you can do that, buy your own time to do it, you know, it sort of changes the game every time. You know, a, a really good book or a really good piece of writing sort of creates waves around it of excitement. Yeah. Um, you know, that's what every editor is waiting for, so. It's really interesting. Um, I was just thinking about this, what, what you were saying there, and, and you know, advice for aspirant writers. So I think myself and Cassie get you know, some people asking us for advice for that. And what I often think, having been through the non-fiction process, is like you need to get an agent, you need to write a proposal, you need to take it to market, and it sort of needs to go in that order. Because if you do that, then like you're only advancing to the next step once it's clear there's appetite for it. And I've seen, you know, I think everyone going through this sort of feels their way through it the first time. Yeah. But it seems to me that there are some, like classic pitfalls of, you know, as you say, like spending so much time on a proposal almost because you're scared to put it out in the world. And there's, it, there's, that's you know. definitely a syndrome and completely yeah. understandable syndrome. Yeah. And know. it seems that I often think with that that almost it gets into a circle where the more effort you're putting in, mm. your sort of sunk cost, both time and emotional, gets greater and greater and greater to a point I, where it just gets too frightening to overdo but it. I, I, but I think that's just the, the non-fiction equivalent of um, a, a very common syndrome amongst fiction writers where they're constantly rewriting their first couple of chapters and they never sort of quite break beyond that. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, you've got to make it as good as you can, but at the same time, you've got to, at a certain point, just you know, get it out there. And you need to get an agent as well, right? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. I mean, I think it, not everyone gets an agent. I mean, there are authors who, who manage somehow to get, get through the system on their own, but I would say sort of, you know, increasingly that's becoming a problem. Um, but what I mean is that, you know, uh, there are people out there who are spending a lot of time in creative writing classes and private editors and so on, and, and that can be really valuable. And, and, and the growth of private editors is entirely new syndrome over the last few years as well. And do you think that they, there's a valid service there? I think, I think, I, I think there, there are people who, unfortunately, will never be published who have been hiring private editors. And those private editors, rightly or wrongly, aren't turning around and saying to them, look, you know, this is just isn't going to work. You can improve your work, but you're never going to be a commercial entity. Um, but for people who somehow have a sense that you know, they might be good at what they're doing or, or could be better, uh, I think a private editor can add a lot, particularly if they've got the right sort of experience of sort of publishing and having edited other books, you know. Look into what they've done before. And what would be your advice for, for a young writer who's looking to get representation, to get an agent? How should they go through that? I, th- I think, I mean, again, it's that, that sort of, it, it's a really hard thing to do, but just sit on your hands a bit. You know, really research, you know, what you're doing. Flex a few writing muscles. Try out different styles. Once you're absolutely convinced that you've got the whole book in your mind and a sort of sense of where it might sit in the market, that's the moment to go and talk to sort of, to agents, you know, unless you happen to be lucky enough to run into them, you know. Um, and, you know, that's the other thing. There are a lot of lot more agents around in the last 20 years than there ever used to be, a lot more good agents around. So, you know, it's not, you know, it, rather like editors, agents are out there looking for really good books and writers to find. So I think it's a lot easier to get an agent these days than it used to. Does, does stuff get picked up off slush piles in yeah. literary agencies? Yeah. yeah. And turning that on its head, what would be your advice to aspirant agents, people who want to, to do what Aspirant agent, God, I don't know. That's a very, that's a very interesting question. I haven't thought about that. Um, if I was starting now, um, I'd spend a lot of time sort of looking at commercial fiction, I think. I mean, that's where sort of the money is at the moment. You know, crime, that terrible phrase, women's commercial fiction, whatever that means. Um, you know, science fiction. I mean, they, they're huge deals going down in that market. 
um, I'm not particularly interested in sort of genre myself. I don't read a lot of it, but but you know, if I was a young age and starting out now, thinking I need to sort of make a lot of money, that's where I would concentrate. Um, it just doesn't seem to go away. Um, but personally, if I if I was myself starting out now, I'd do exactly what I've done, which is sort of you know intelligent, quirky fiction, um, which may not be you know that obvious in in one or another. And uh, and the joy of being educated by proposal. I mean, that that's the joy of nonfiction for me. As someone rings up and goes, you know, I'm doing a book on whatever it may be. You know, bats. I've got bats in my mind because someone's just exactly done that. Um, but it could be mathematics. It could be sort of earthworms. It doesn't matter. You know, someone who's got real enthusiasm, if they can convey that, that's a great joy. You know. I love, I know when we finish on a positive note because we've had uh, a few conversations with people that have ended with doom and gloom and the, the you know, the, the near destruction of the industry or, or the, the fact that the whole publishing world is about to, to end up in ruins. So it, it's lovely to end on a positive note. Thank you. Um, and thank you um, so much for speaking to us. Um, well, thank you for putting up with the puppy. He's <laughs> <laughs> now gone to sleep. Finally. <laughs> We hope you enjoyed that as much as we enjoyed recording it and um, apologies for the scrabbling sounds of the dog trying to eat the wires <laughs> and the microphone. Uh, it was adorable, so it's, it's all all right, but maybe we can forgive the dog for that. Um, but now a brief update from us. Simon, what have you been up to? Uh, this week I've um, sort of been on holiday, but also been doing the uh, fact-checking uh, and editing for my piece uh, on Scotland for Outside um, and gearing up for the new term, as it were. Uh, which involves trying to finish a book. Cassia, what about you? Uh, I have mostly spent... I've, I've actually had a, a very, very busy um, couple of weeks. Uh, not only have I got the book on the go, I also wrote a couple of columns um, for L Decoration. I'm sort of um, trying to to do them particularly quickly at the moment because I'm about to go on honeymoon. And then I also had a big piece to write, actually for The Economist, um, about uh, Stephen King, which I think will have been out for a little while by the time this podcast um, comes out, but it involved listening to... Um, all of Stephen King. All of Stephen King. I actually downloaded loads of um, uh, loads of the audible audiobooks of his work and then only managed to get through it because it is 45 hours long it's brilliant but that was the only is one that, I managed to re-listen to is longer than The Silk Roads? it is longer than The Silk Roads uh, <laughs> finally found one podcast favourite <laughs> but yeah I, I mostly spent my time um, listening to Stephen King watching Stephen King on various um, different forms of media and then following him on Twitter which is very entertaining excellent this has been Always Take Notes. It is hosted by me, Cassia Sinclair, and also by Simon. That's me, Simon Acom. Um, our producers are Olivia Craylin, Ed Kiernan, and Liz Davies. Our music is done by Jess Danheiser. Our social media guru is uh, Zara Hankir. And our graphic design was done by James Edgar. And obviously we're on all the social media. Uh, we're on Facebook at Always Take Notes on Instagram under the same name. You can find us on Twitter at Take Notes Always. And our website is alwaystakenotes.com. And this is the moment when I um, beg you uh, to implore. <laughs> implore you uh, to leave us a review on iTunes. It really helps <laughs> um, and spread the word uh, about always take notes and help other writers. <laughs>